I'm Candace Michelle, and this is Our Community. Well, it's another beautiful, crisp autumn day in Brookings. We've had enough rain in the past few weeks to end our fire season here, thank goodness. And last night, it got distinctly cold. In fact, the last two nights, it's gotten distinctly cold. The weather reports I've seen said it got down somewhere between 37 and 34 degrees. And it's pretty cold for this time of year. My thoughts always go to our unsheltered and marginally sheltered neighbors when the weather starts getting cold and wet. Folks, a lot of them longtime residents here, who find themselves sometimes literally between a rock and a hard place with not much help in sight. One of the places they know they can get some help is at St. Timothy's Episcopal Church, that little red church on the corner of First Street and Old County Road, directly across the street from Azalea Park. Interestingly, the Brookings City Council appears to be trying to limit the services provided there. And Brookings and St. Tim's and the Episcopal Diocese of Oregon are currently engaged in a lawsuit— that will determine how much say a city government can have in the practice of religion. My guests today are Father Bernie from St. Tim's and Robert O'Sullivan, an historian, teacher, research, and former minister who relocated to Brookings about six years ago. Welcome to Brookings, gentlemen. Thank you for having us, Candace. Welcome to Brookings. No, welcome to the show. Right? You've been here in Brookings. I've only been here seven years, and I need to be (laughs) welcomed. I'm I'm learning that. Well, you know that if you weren't born here, you are considered to be a newcomer. I mean, Californicator. Or that. (laughs) I mean, I've been here for nearly 20 years, and I am still basically considered, you know, newcomer, newcomer, right? Yeah. So, Bernie, let's start with you. Um, I'm sure that most of our listeners know you've been here forever. You were born and raised here, right? Yeah. Well, I was born at the Seaside Hospital down in Crescent City before the new hospital was built. And you know, the new hospital was built 33 years ago or something, 32 years ago. The one in Crescent City? Yeah, 1992. Okay. That's the new hospital. Wow. Yeah, the Sutter and Coast Hospital is just... the new hospital. So when you talk about, <laughs> see, that's how I know you're a newcomer. You don't think of that as the new hospital. No. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty funny. So you went to Brookings High, didn't you? Brookings Harbor High, yeah. Oh, Brookings Harbor yeah. High. Right, right, right. And I do believe that one of your good friends was Tony Barron. Yeah, Tony and I, uh, he's a couple years younger than me in high school. So uh-huh. when I got, when I really got to know him, it was after I had graduated and uh, we spent a lot of time together. We had a lot of fun together. You hung and, out and got in trouble yeah, and yeah, set always hillsides can, on fire. We and, did. You know. <laughs> we did. And uh, I've always considered him a very good friend and it hurts my heart that uh, right now we're, we're not able to uh, have conversations because of this pending litigation. Yep, that would be that would definitely be painful. Yeah, but it'll be over soon enough, and when yeah. it does, hopefully we can um, hopefully you know reestablish our friendship. Right. So you went on to become a commercial fisherman, and then you decided to become. Well, it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, it's not really that I decided. It's more. It's a little bit more complicated than I just woke up one day and thought I'd become a priest in the Episcopal Church. It Uh, usually is. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, my wife and I, um, she's a year older than I am, and uh, she graduated from Brookings Harbor High School in 1984. And we had already been a couple for quite a little while by then, Mm because we um, started to date when we were at uh, Azalea Middle School. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. It's pretty fun, huh? Okay. Yeah. Middle school. I remember the day. It was March 13th, 1980. I remember where I was standing. It was uh, outside of the gymnasium. Mm. Which was brand new at the time, by the way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I asked her if she wanted to go steady, and she said yes. And uh, here we are. Oh. <laughs> Only a few years later. Yeah. So <laughs> we, since she graduated the year before I did, she graduated in 1984 from Brookings Harbor High. She went to the community college down in Crescent City, College mm-hmm. of the Redwoods, for a year, mm-hmm. and then was a transfer student to the uh, university that we ended up going to in Salem. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. And then you somehow got, 
ordained as a minister. Well, that, well you're jumping ahead a little bit. We, or a priest. And <laughs> so, I, we got, so t- just help me with these terms, because I always trip uh-huh. over myself. So you're a priest. I am. A, I am an Episcopal priest, yes. Okay. So does that mean you are or are not a minister? Well, priests are ministers. They're pastors, okay. reverend. Okay. So is minister kind of a definition of what you do? Well, yeah. I mean, hope. I would hope that all Christians have ministries and, you know, okay. they minister to others. Okay. But certainly, I guess, minister with a capital M. But, uh, um, yeah, I'm a minister. I'm a reverend. I'm a pastor. I'm a priest. And uh, the type of priest that I am is a vicar. Okay. So I serve vicariously for my bishop in oh. this small congregation. Vicar, vicarious. I mm-hmm. love it. Makes sense. Huh? Yeah, it does. I love yeah, the language. Yeah, but that didn't, you know, I didn't get that. Uh, that didn't happen until the year like 2002 or something that I okay. felt that I, sh- you know, the call to ordain ministry. Right. But, you know, my wife and I, we, when we graduated college, we, uh, well, we got married. Um, I proposed to her the day she graduated from college. <laughs> and then we got married that summer <laughs> in uh, 1988. Don't by, let uh, that grass grow under your feet, well, you know? You know, it's kind of fun because uh, the Reverend Dr. Gordy Myra, Lutheran pastor, uh, because my wife is Lutheran, was the one that officiated our wedding up here at um, Trinity Lutheran. You know, um, I know I always think it's funny to say it's behind Dollar General because obviously the Lutheran Church was there way before Dollar <laughs> yes. General was. So you know, <laughs> and to use Dollar General as a landmark, I, know, I don't know what it, to say it about kinda, that. It kind of knocks me out. But, I know it kind of knocks me out. But because... that's that's where where we got married. Um, you Dollar know, and, General. Well, <laughs> up the hill from Dollar General. Be careful what you say. Dollar General. That was an empty field then, of course. <laughs> and but uh, we got married, and then we moved to Portland after I graduated because I still had a year of college to go. And we lived in Portland. We had Portland jobs for a little bit. And then uh, when we were thinking we were going to have babies, it made sense to come home so that because mm-hmm. both of our parents live here, mm-hmm. and uh, so it made sense to have uh, grandparents nearby. Yep. So uh, that's why my daughters were born in the new hospital. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, Sutter Coast. I love that. Yeah. And Robert or Bob, whichever one, right? Sure. Or Silky. Yes. We could call you Silky. All three. Um, so you were also a minister. Yes, I was. And I studied for the ministry early on in life, uh, but kept going off in other directions, not sure I want to do this. And uh, I wound up in in a whole series of events where I took time off or did a what was called an in, in, a vicarage in that particular tradition, but it was a ministerial internship. But that all took a while, and I didn't actually get ordained as a pastor and, and have a call until I must have been in my late 50s or so. Mm. Uh, I did lots of things in politics and media and uh, for about 15, 20 years, then decided that I would take a try at teaching. Mm-hmm. And shortly after that, my old teenage church, as I like to call it, had been declining in its membership and wondered if I would become a part-time pastor for them. And I jumped through some hoops in that particular denomination and served in that capacity for something like 23 years. Wow. I was a high school teacher all the same time. Oh, my goodness. So are you saying, Robert, that you uh, served the congregation that you had been a member of when you were a teenager? Yes. Well, we share that in common. Isn't that funny? We share quite a bit strangely in common, I think. I know. It is And interestingly enough, Bernie, you've continued to be a commissioner commercial fisherman. Yeah. So when we moved back to town in 1990, I bought a boat for my grandfather and Mm -hmm. I started crab fishing. And then I did that uh, continuously since then. Mm -hmm. I haven't, well, I had to miss a season when, uh, when I did my, um, I, I, my first three years of seminary were done uh, in Eugene. And so Mm -hmm. I commuted for that. But my last year of seminary I had to do in uh, the Washington DC area in Alexandria, That would be a rough commute. Yeah, I couldn't do that. Yeah. See, that was the thing is I could have uh, I could have went to seminary down in Berkeley and I would have kind of commuted. I would have came mm-hmm. home every once in a while, but I wanted my family to come with me to mm-hmm. seminary. So that uh, that year, um, I missed that crab season, uh, you know, in person, although I was on the phone a lot. Right, right. And so what what I find interesting is is you were a commissioner 
you are still a commercial fisherman, and you were teaching at the same time. So it was like you you both were doing... Bivocational is a fancy yeah, term for right? it. Right. for priests right. and non-fancy. I know. Term. It's and kind of a, amazing. And there's a long tradition of that within Christianity. For yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I've met your lovely wife who is now departed, but she was a joy. And listening to her play the piano, Bob was one of the one of the great joys of my life. She was amazing. She also was bivocational. Uh, wow. She was a lawyer, mm-hmm. and uh, she got there by unusual means, uh, what's called law office study. She didn't finish law school, but she worked with a with a uh, attorney to become eligible, mm-hmm. and later became a real lo- leader in the in law. She became the head of the state of California's Board of Legal Specialization, and also served on American Bar Association committees oh, and wow. uh, a group called the uh, National Baton Twirlers Association. No, I got it wrong. <laughs> uh, they have the same initials as the National Baton Twirlers Association. Okay. It's the National Board of Trial Advocacy. Okay. And, uh, I'm thinking, really? The batons? Uh, okay. <laughs> and uh, a, a curious thing about that is many of those people were moneyed lawyers who were trial lawyers, Mm -hmm. and that often happens by accident. There was a plane crash where they had a relative was on it or some or ambulance chaser got someplace quickly. And they're not necessarily attuned to consumer issues about the law. Mm -hmm. Well, Alice came from a workers' comp background, Mm -hmm. and she was dealing with injured workers all the time. Mm -hmm. And kind of let those people understand that a lot of folk are not just People who had serious, serious injuries that made you rich, but a lot of folk are hurting, yeah. and lawyers should be thinking about consumer protection right. and things like that. And she was involved in educating them on that way and also on other issues. Uh, the most remarkable probably was uh, she She said they met like I, two or three times a year, usually in big cities across the land. And uh, Alice always got them to be involved in doing something locally to, in some way or another, thank them for being, for allowing them to be there in essence. And in New Orleans, she hooked up with a group uh, called Friends of Women or something like that and wound up having these hotshot lawyers putting together kits for sex workers, for drug addicts, and with Mm. things like clean needles and condoms Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. what your legal rights are and and had these attorneys uh, actually consulting and meeting some of those people to understand more about their legal rights. So she was pretty remarkable in things she accomplished. Very (laughs) avant-garde, right? Right on the leading edge there. Yeah, Yeah, that's, that's pretty remarkable. So if we if we you know talk a little bit about St. Timothy's here, um, St. Timothy's has been around for a long time. Yeah, well the 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 congregation was founded in 1946, and then the land where we are now was acquired in 1952, and the building was completed maybe 53 or 54. And so. all of that is well before the city of Brookings was incorporated. Well, as I think a the city, city was think. incorporated around the same time. Okay, but you know they didn't have a uh, municipal code yet. Ah, okay. And then uh, as the municipal code was developed, um, you know we were certainly uh, whatever grandfather grandfather Dan, Dan. Was on the zoning. Yeah. Right, right. Although it's it. It's normal to have a church in a residential area. I, I think I heard that uh, of the 15 churches in um, the city of Brickings and the city limits, mm-hmm. that of the 15 churches, 14 of them are in uh, residential zoning. Yeah. I mean, I, I think. throughout the land. Yeah. I, I, I'm trying to remember back in my youth and, you know, yeah, it was all, it was all residential. I think it's deliberate. I think, uh, I think there's, um, you know, the American people in general, they appreciate what a church offers as far as uh, like social safety net type stuff. Mm -hmm. You ever thought about why is it that churches are tax exempt? And it's because uh, they bring value to the community. And uh, that's kind of like a way to help compensate them for this societal expectation right. that churches are going to look after um, the people who are falling on hard times. Absolutely. So the uh, you know the alms that churches provide are um, are, uh, are are 
highly valued typically by um by the communities in the uh, and not just the United States but throughout the world mm-hmm. and often, throughout history often they take forms of things that uh, social service agencies not, might not readily be able to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of flexibility and, and sensibility that uh, I've seen shown remarkably at St. Tim's. Well, you know something that it kind of makes me think of? So a lot of hospitals are nonprofit hospitals, and, and in exchange for their nonprofit status, they're expected to give a certain amount of pro bono work. Mm-hmm. It's law, yeah. actually. <laughs> <laughs> the laws are not always followed. I suspect yeah. your wife would have known that. <laughs> so the, the, the idea that, uh, and sometimes I use the word like indigent care, and I don't like the word indigent, but... Yeah, somebody comes in and they can't pay and mm-hmm. they write it off. Mm-hmm. And in exchange for the fact that they write off a certain amount of, uh, of their s- services they provide, they're given, uh, you know, uh, uh, nonprofit status. Well, it's similar with churches in the sense that there, there is a social obligation of a church that uh, part of the social contract that churches provide into the community for people beyond their membership. Yes. I, obviously, beyond, I mean, if it's right. just for their membership, then what's the point? Yeah. So we're talking about various different forms of alms. Alms in you know, is, alms come in many, many different forms. Yeah, yeah. I remember um, that we had coat drives um, because where where I lived in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, it was cold. So you know, you you had to have your kids had to have coats. You know, so there were coat drives and there were spaghetti dinners and you know they there was. A, a fair that the church sponsored every year. And, and it wasn't just the parishioners who were allowed to come there. I mean, everybody was in course. And encouraged. part of the ministry of virtually every church is some sort of counseling, right. uh, some sort of being there to receive confessions or, yep. or just talk through stuff. Right. And they're also any good pastor would know valuable referrals. And at St. Tim's, they, they have kind of perfected some of those referrals. Right. Well, the deal is, is that uh, like just, I'm losing track of my days a little bit. I think today, as we record this, it's Saturday. I think today's Saturday. But, Remember, uh, tomorrow morning is Sunday. Oh, yeah. that'll be important to know. There we okay. go. <laughs> but you know what, though? Deacon Linda is going to preach for me, so okay. Okay. I'll be okay on that. <laughs> But because uh, I haven't written a sermon, so that's good that she's going <laughs> to for tomorrow. But just yesterday, a woman came in who was grieving. She had lost her husband to uh, to an ex- unexpected death, mm-hmm. and um, not only uh, did she need um, to be, uh, you know, to have to to be provided pastoral care through the form of um, our lay chaplain, who is uh, going through clinical chaplain training right now. But also, um, she needed to um, have some uh, counsel about how it is that she would go about obtaining her husband's remains. Yes. Mm -hmm. And how does she go about obtaining a death certificate? And we know we have answers to these questions. And And those are very important questions. Yeah. Uh, This woman was in a crisis. Yeah. Yeah. And when we respond to somebody who's in crisis, that's, that's... right part and parcel with our faith. And you know what the thing about it, though, is that uh, we think about crises like, you know, something sudden happens like, you know, her husband dying. But some people are in these prolonged crises. They've been in a crisis for months or perhaps even years, and they haven't been able to get their feet out from, you know, get their feet under them. They haven't been able to, you know, some catastrophic thing happened and they never, they didn't find the good uh, pastoral care that they needed maybe initially. And so they're still disoriented. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, so to think that a crisis is just this acute thing, it, it, it's not necessarily. There's different kinds of crises. Well, and I think that we, all of us, I mean, we've been through COVID now. Um, hopefully we're, you know, kind of on the tail end of COVID. But um, that was a crisis that just kept going. Um, you know, I, I spent three years basically locked down in my house and, you know, it, it was rough. Yeah, I, I lost my wife, uh, in April of 2020 and, uh, and COVID I'm older hit. Yeah. and I just, uh, it was, no. I, I was extremely isolated for quite a long time. Absolutely. And, uh, 
But And one thing that was real obvious to me is the town had pretty much shut down. Mm-hmm. But St. Tim's was a place where I and a lot of others got our COVID shots. Yep. If they needed a COVID test, it could be gotten there. Uh, and it was just a place where a lot of people had very, very basic needs. And needs that out and ho- housed people yes. probably don't even think about. Yep. Uh, yep, right. Needing showers, needing a place to charge your cell phone, right. uh, needing clean clothing. And St. Tim's has been remarkably sensitive to those kind of needs and and at working out ways of doing it. They have a voucher program with, worked out with a laundromat that they mm-hmm. can come certain times for three hours, uh, three hours of whatever it is. And often a member, uh, including pastoral staff of St. Tim's, will be down at the laundromat meeting people and, mm-hmm. and letting them know that uh, this is a congregation that really cares. Well, you know, and the thing is that if you, if you actually envision yourself as a Christian, it, that means something. That that right. That means that you are following Jesus Christ. That that's what that means. And if you look at the teachings and what Jesus Christ did, I, it, I don't know. I don't know how you can come to any other conclusion than that. That is your duty as a Christian. That's true enough. Candace, but the thing is, is even if we were a church that worshipped the, you know, flying spaghetti monster or whatever, <laughs> we would still be a church. Yes. So even if we weren't followers of Jesus Christ, which of course we are, but mm-hmm. even if we had some other right. faith that we followed, we still uh, have... would, would need. We we still have the right in the United States yes. of America to practice whatever the faith is that we have. You have the protection of the Constitution. Well, it turns out, Duh. you know, you know something that I. <laughs> Something I found out not very long ago, Candace, is that there was a church in Florida that was practicing animal sacrifice. And I don't know what kind of church it was. It was some, uh, you know, hybrid of some kind. And their community decided they shouldn't be sacrificing animals uh, in their church. And so they tried to stop them from doing that. But you know what? That's that's protected re- under the mm-hmm. religious freedoms, mm-hmm. and so that church mm-hmm. continues to to uh, do that. And you don't have to agree. With, and, and by the right? way, we're not sacrificing animals. No, at no. Times, but <laughs> I'm just saying that exactly that in the United States of America, religious freedom that's right. takes the form of many different practices. Right. And it's to me feeding people, connecting them to uh, laundry vouchers, right. making sure they have clean clothes and a place to. Uh, get a cup of coffee or charge their phone like Pastor Robert right, said. Right. All that stuff seems relatively tame to me. But, you know, what the problem is is that um, y- people have to get to the church and they walk through these residential neighborhoods and, you know, they don't levitate in. They walk. No, and no. so people see them. And in our society, when you see someone who's unhoused, certainly when you see somebody who's mentally ill and they're in the middle of a, some sort of a manic phase or some sort of a psychotic break um, in our society. That's a, that's we we respond, mm-hmm. you know, with fear. Yes. And exactly. uh, when when people are scared, you know, they're gonna yeah. they're gonna try to try to eliminate whatever they perceive the threat to be. And so, unfortunately, some of the people that we serve have been perceived as threatening. Interestingly, I've been. Uh, communicating kind of nationwide through progressivechristianity.org and other places ab- about the issues raised here. And I just got an email from someplace in a Minnesota suburb, so I, I, I assume of the Twin Cities, and uh, said a Lutheran church uh, there is facing similar problems. I don't know all the details. And it happens to be next to a large park. Mm-hmm. And there's no way that St. Tim's can be responsible for what goes on in their park. And the police just better police it better if there are issues that that well, uh, it, continue. And, and it's remarkable, isn't it? I mean, it, it seems like, again, a no-brainer. It's not that the people who are coming for the lunch service are then camping in the church lobby and 
staying there overnight. And I mean, that's yeah. not what's going on. Well, part of the problem, though, is that when we hosted the cars in the parking lot mm-hmm. during the uh, and beginning that was the of the city's pandemic, idea, wasn't it? It was. It was. It, you know, um, my friend Jake was the mayor at the time, and they. Uh, the idea was that if every church in town hosted three cars, then right. we would have places for people to be during a pandemic. And don't forget, that was highly uh, infectious. A exactly. lot of people, a lot of people in our own community, died from that. Yes. And nationwide, over a million people did. So, yeah. I think you know, in hindsight, we think, well, you know, glad well, that's over. But uh, it was, it was really catastrophic. If St. Tim's did not do what it did during COVID, there probably would be a thousand more deaths. I agree. And and uh, Brookings Core uh, developed out of uh, yeah. out of yep. St. Tim's. And uh, I mean, we had no public health uh, official. Was, there the was city, nothing. The, the happening. state cut it down. Well, it they off. well uh, they did they did, but you know, in in response to uh, the need, mm-hmm. because initially, and I I don't know how much I've talked about this publicly, but uh, Initially, the reason why I wanted to be a COVID vaccination site was because I knew that poor and unhoused people were going to have a hard time getting the COVID vaccine. Yes. And so uh, my target demographic was just going to be uh, you know, who might be at a soup kitchen. Mm-hmm. And but the, the reality was that none of us could get them. And so guess what we did? Exactly. We stepped it up and exactly. uh, started, um, you know, we, 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 couldn't, we couldn't discriminate against housed folks. <laughs> So we had to even if we work, clean, let them see what it feels even like. Even if we had had a shower that morning, <laughs> so we had we had to make uh, the resources we had at yeah. our disposal available to everyone, and right. and uh, I was really proud of the way we responded. We ended up doing something like forty five hundred shots, I think, over wow. the course of our uh, wow. shot clinic. It might, and then I think we did sixty five or seven thousand. 6,500 or 7,000 COVID tests. Wow. And then, uh, and one thing too, I want to make sure that uh, I make clear is that we did get a bunch of money from the Oregon Health Authority. We got $410,000. The purpose of that was to um, disperse it to the people who are quarantining so that they wouldn't have to feel compelled to go to work. Yes. So the whole idea is that uh, you get COVID, you're going to need to, you're going to need to stay home for two weeks, but you who can afford to miss two weeks of work in the United States of America? The vast majority of uh, people who work are living paycheck to paycheck. Yep. So if they miss two weeks of work, they could miss their rent. They could end up becoming unhoused. Our whole mission when it comes to our ministries is to create stability in people's lives and to, if they're already housed, to keep them housed. Right. And if they're unhoused to get them housed, I mean, that's our, that's our job as far as uh, my I mean, well, sort of like our niche, I guess. Right. Different, there's a different, different churches do different ministries, but that's kind of right there uh, in the niche, in the core of what it is that we do. And so that was a natural fit for us mm-hmm. to have people who tested positive for COVID to ask them if they were going to be able to pay their rent, to be able to pay their utilities, and were they going to be able to have access to food? Because we don't need them roaming around in the grocery store no. while they're positive for COVID. So... Uh, We had uh, that. So that's they called it wraparound care. Mm -hmm. And so we had a number of people that uh, that were part of our team that would make contact with the person that had tested positive, would uh, kind of evaluate what their needs were. And then um, and then we had a whole process of making sure that they had their financial needs met. And so the four hundred thousand dollars didn't exactly lie in your pocket. It didn't. I didn't take any of it. I I did not. My my salary that the church pays me, which is eighteen hundred and twenty dollars a month, I think. I think I get paid because uh, I got a raise a while ago, a couple of years ago. I got a raise. I think I get one thousand eight hundred twenty dollars a, a month, and uh, it did not change as a result of all this. And that comes from the church. That doesn't come from anywhere else. That comes right. out of our operating budget from the people who tithe, you know, the parishioners. It comes out of their pledges. And if that money came from OHA, they are very, very particular that it gets spent on the thing that it's supposed to. Yeah, it was, yeah, yeah, the monitoring was rigorous. Of course. But, and uh, we did have to, uh, OHA told us that uh, this went beyond what a volunteer should be expected to do and asked us to compensate uh, our paid staff. And the paid staff was not just members of the church. It was a whole... Uh, we have, 
many people that we interact with. Mm -hmm. It's not just, uh, you know, people who just because somebody, um, if somebody doesn't come and worship on a Sunday morning with us, that doesn't change the fact that they're part of who we are. And because uh, who, I, you know, that's kind of nebulous. How do you define who's a member of your church when there's some, when people participate in the ministries of the church in so many different ways, not just Sunday morning? I mean, Sunday morning worship is not the defining factor, I think, in who's a member. So... I'd like to talk a little more about uh, the impact of the time when COVID was so strong here. Mm -hmm. uh, while St. Tim's stepped up in its services and responded remarkably, most of the other churches in town, including those who had regular feeding programs, shut down, or yes. shut down at least in terms of feeding programs and, yeah. and other ways the, of reaching and out. to interrupt, the Presbyterian Church was the exception to that. They never mm -hmm. missed a meal. Okay. And then the other churches, they were trying to figure out like the uh, Trinity Lutheran and the start of the sea, they're trying to figure out what are we going to do? How are we going to put, what's our best practices going to be? They're right. trying to figure out what, what, how is it that we can make this keep everybody safe? Mm -hmm. right. And they came back online relatively quickly. And uh, now, um, as far as I can tell, the Trinity Lutheran uh, Friday meal is the most popular meal of all of the meals. Ooh, do they oh, serve wow. really no. good stuff? No, they have. <laughs> I may they have, have to some check exceptionally it out. good um, cooks. Uh, uh, there maybe we go. more accessible there we go. location. Well, uh, you know what know. it is. They they got. Uh, I I don't know what it is. They have a really uh, upbeat atmosphere. They got some good. really high quality uh, volunteers in their kitchen, and uh, and they they just do an outstanding job. Mm -hmm. But I think that that you know, Bob, your point is. Excellent. There was a void when yeah. when COVID hit and we all kind of went, oh, my God, yeah. what are we doing? Well, what do we do? There was a void. There was yes. a void in services. Nobody was stepping up except St. Tim's. And that's just the reality. So, you know, if, if we're sitting around going, oh, well, you know, they overstepped. Uh, no, they stepped into the void. Nobody was stepping up. There had been churches feeding people seven days a week, and, and St. No Tim's longer. wound up having to no, do virtually I, that all I by know. itself. There was no COVID testing happening anywhere. Trying to get a COVID test was ridiculous. Yeah, people Trying were, to get a shot people, was ridiculous. People were coming up from Smith River. I people know. were coming down from Gold Beach. I know. There, was a, there were... There were people from uh, uh, far and wide that were coming to get tested, and we're very grateful for the yes. fact that we were because well, we were open six days a week during yeah, that time uh, yeah. doing the COVID testing. Yep, mm -hmm. and and I distinctly we took Sundays off. From I that. distinctly remember that the nurse walked to my car because my husband's disabled. Yes, and gave Phil the shot. So we we went into the. Uh, the skilled nursing facility mm -hmm. on several occasions yep. to, to vaccinate both the staff and the residents. Yep. Yep. We went to the other assisted living places in town to do the same thing. We did house calls. There were numerous different times when we went to somebody's home yep. to vaccinate them. And in fact, uh, traveled all the way to Gold Beach to do that. And one time even down to Crescent City to vaccinate somebody who wow. is, uh, which, you know, it's Oregon vaccine that was being paid for by, you know, the Oregon Health Authority, but we, we smuggle it across the state line. You know, if you're don't talking tell. about somebody's well, life. I think maybe the statute of limitations is up. <laughs> we yeah, actually, probably. Yeah, <laughs> we snuck across the uh, state border to vaccinate Smuggled a shut-in. that vaccine. <laughs> yeah, I, I would like to talk a little about what happened next in terms of the law. Mm -hmm. And uh, some 29 or 30 people signed a petition mm -hmm. that described... Uh, Oh, alleged a lot of things about crime in the neighborhood, but talked about hostile vagrants and undesirables. Right. And that got to the city council and the mayor, and their response to it was to come up with a scheme to uh, limit feedings at churches to two times a week for a certain number of hours and to somehow assume that the city had the ability to start uh, affecting the practice of religion in that way. And uh, most of the other churches went along with this, uh, but St. Tim's, I'm proud, with their backing by the diocese, realized there was a huge First Amendment issue, which is now unfortunately bringing light to Brookings that's not exactly positive, just like the city manager stuff does. Right. 
Yep. And uh, what the law says, uh, the U.S. Constitution, is uh, right up with free speech and freedom of the press and right to assembly and the redress of grievances is uh, no establishment of religion and a guarantee of the free exercise thereof. In the Oregon Constitution, it's even more clear. It says mm -hmm. basically that no government shall in any way whatever interfere with people performing their religious functions. Right. And beyond that, there's federal law that was passed unanimously by both houses of Congress back in the year 2000. The background of that is for years, there was lots of controversies just of this sort. People didn't like what was going on in a church. Sometimes it was controversies about eminent domain. I personally knew of this before, because for a while I went to a Lutheran church and parochial school in Los Angeles, and a couple of years later, the whole thing was destroyed because the freeway system needed that mm. property. Yeah. And Congress, congressmen got tired of all these complaints they were hurt, they were hearing about uh, churches doing this and that, and so they passed unanimously by both houses a bill that clearly says that you must have a compelling state interest that cannot be fulfilled by other means before you can at all mess around with the freedom of the practice of religion. And uh, I'm afraid the city council either didn't do its homework or thinks that laws that apply to every other city in the country somehow don't apply to them. And it's creating an enormous storm of billable hours uh, and it, the ones that uh, are most benefiting from this are lawyers. Everybody else is kind of just caught in the maelstrom. Yeah, that part's unfortunate, isn't it? It is. But you know what? Uh, what I'll kind of add to the to the petition is, uh, you know, our so we were the only church that did have the three cars in the parking lot at the time. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about what uh, April of twenty twenty one, I guess, mm -hmm. and. Um, Unfortunately, our mental health adapt hadn't been put into place yet, you know, for mental health mm -hmm. uh, services. So they didn't have any kind of response with, say, their peer support people that they have now or their crisis uh, response team. And so it was probably either Freedom Health or maybe Curry uh, Health, whatever they, what was it called? Curry uh, Health. Community, Curry, Curry Community, Community Health, health. I think. Whatever, whatever yeah. our mental health was before yeah. uh, adapt. it. They weren't able to come out and respond because of the whole COVID thing, and neither was the um, Oregon Department of Human Services. We right. we couldn't have like uh, um, Adult Protective Services couldn't come out and respond, so they were all stuck in their um, various different offices because of the rules that have been put in place. Right. So our people in the cars they um, they started their their mental health devolved. Because there they are, you know, in a car all day and uh, couldn't and, really. And you should try living much. in a car and see how that feels, right? You are your mental health is going to devolve. I, I was kind of, and in hindsight, it's surprising it didn't happen sooner. Yeah, but uh, you know, there was a couple of the people were on edge mm -hmm. with no; they had access to no resources at all beyond what the church could provide. Right. What they needed was access to mental health, like I say. Yep. And so they started to um, attack each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, the people, you know, that live in the neighborhood, they didn't want to see that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's it's a threatening kind of a thing to watch people attack each other. So that's what the, that's what I think. Um, Got the wheels going. Yeah. Huh? they And so what I thought was going to happen there is that, okay, so we'll close down the car camping because by the time the end of June of 2021 had happened, uh, things were changing for the better. And so we, uh, we closed up the car camping thing and, uh, and made it so that no one was allowed to sleep on the church grounds at all. And I thought that would resolve the issue. And uh, it surprised me when, when the city council decided that they were going to limit our feeding somehow, because those two things were completely unrelated. But my intention all along was that, okay, there's, you know, the, the neighborhood's alarmed. Let's get together and have like a summit. Let's, let's get everybody around a big table, like in the, mm -hmm. uh, ECU, EOC, 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 uh, EOC yeah. emergency operation center. Yeah. Cause they got a big there's an opportunity table for a big table it's a there. Big table. And, uh, and I, I, my hope was is that uh, some city official would 
facilitate a discussion between the people who live in the neighborhood and the church and other mm-hmm. concerned citizens. Mm-hmm. Maybe, uh, you know, KCIW could have been there mm-hmm. to, to record it all for the people who weren't able to attend. And we would come up with solutions and, uh, and um, reassurances and... Uh, and actually define the problem. Yeah. Because the problem was not that there were people being fed lunch. That was not the problem. Right, right, right. Ever. No, the problem was, you know, these people that... And, and by the way, the, the, the people who were having those uh, physical mm-hmm. confrontations, confrontations with each other, they both did end up in the state hospital, in the state mental hospital, eventually. Yeah. It took forever. Of course. But eventually they ended up. Right. So this isn't... Which is I mean, where they should so have I, been. Yeah. So when I say that it was a mental health crisis, it, it, it really was. They both... Yes. And, and, I, and I know it seems like, yeah, sure, I'm just saying that. How could that be true? But... I promise you, it's a fact that they both ended up in the state hospital. Yeah. And, uh, and it, you weren't the one who chose who would be parking at the church. Well, or, I did. Well, or, I did. Or, well, we did. Okay. But the thing is, is that the reason why uh, the reason why we picked those particular people is because they were hi- highly vulnerable. That was like our criteria is who's the most vulnerable and who's going to benefit the most from stability. Right. And our thought was somebody who is potentially, I mean, everybody's kind of unstable. I mean, I am. I am. Well, there you go. I mean, but there are well degrees. It, but there's degrees <laughs> and circumstances that bring it out even worse. Yeah. And certainly I didn't anticipate that part of it. And and there's no doubt that we would not do that again mm-hmm. under those circumstances because we have to have uh, case management. We have to have access to mental health uh, professionals. We have to have access to, uh, you know, uh, primary care providers. We have to have access to the services that are provided by the Oregon Department of Human Services. So, uh, you know. We were in the middle of a pandemic, Bernie. We were making it up as we went along because we had never been there before. And our intentions were good. Of course they were. The problem was is that we got, you know, the whole thing was a lot bigger than we could handle. Yes. And I I readily admit that. And, uh, you know, we stopped it and we're not going to do it again. Uh, and core developed and, and took yep. some of the burden away. They did. Uh, and we have hopes that at some point there will be a shelter in town that will be able to um, have a place for people to be where they will have all those things that I mentioned in place. And you pray for management. it every Sunday. Yep. We do. Well, I we think very it's a much lot do. And I almost have it committed to memory. Let's hear it. I can't. <laughs> okay. I know I'll mess it up. <laughs> if Deacon Linda were here, she could. Uh, <laughs> but what the, what the fact is, is that... Uh, uh, my, we're kind of going the long way around the fence here around, you know, the, unfortunately what I would have liked to have done two and a half years ago, I still want to do that. I still want to have, you know, a community summit, whatever mm-hmm. you want to call that, that hopefully will be facilitated by some city official. So once all the lawsuit and legal stuff is resolved, I still want to have that sit down meeting I, I'm afraid that some people have really um, just thrown up their hands and they're not going to be willing to come to the table now because they're so laid into the, you know, everything, right. all this stuff that's gone on, all the animosity that's developed. But it's certainly my hope that we'll be able to uh, work collaboratively as a community to kind of get a handle on how how do we address these um this homeless crisis that isn't going away. Right. It's, it's, it's getting worse. It, for, it's getting in my, worse. in my observation, it's getting worse. And I don't see how it's not, I don't see the without economics us, are such a factor. I know. And the lack of housing. Yeah. Yes. So yes. the, the way that you solve homelessness is you put people in homes, right? Right. But where, where are those homes going to come from? Unless we figure out as a community, how to acquire That's things right. like shelters and transitional homes and That's group right. housing and, and, uh, public housing and more subsidized. I mean, there's yep. lots and lots of things that we can add into the equation if we can just agree. But one of the things that we have to come to terms with is, um, we have to stop blaming the victim. We have to stop right. saying, well, if that person would just get a job, they would be able to solve their problem right. themselves. Right. Well, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about people with traumatic brain injuries. We're talking about people with 
pretty pretty robust mental health issues, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's schizophrenia or uh, obsessive compulsive disorder that cre that prevents them from being able to work. Yeah. Whether it's schizophrenia, I can't. Be I never, in my wildest imagination, thought that I would find so much untreated psychosis in our community. Yeah, it is real and it is rampant, and and these are homegrown folks. We're not yeah. bringing them in from San Francisco. These are people who went through, and you know, part of the reason why I think. Uh, maybe 20 years ago, I don't remember when, we led the state for uh, domestic abuse in our county. Oh. We were the number one uh, county for, uh, for domestic abuse. Wow. And um, that was about the time that like the Oasis shelter was getting rolled out mm -hmm. in, in response to that need. Mm -hmm. But we had a tremendous number of um, kids who were growing up in these really dysfunctional households. Yep. And if you're predisposed to... Um, to mental illness, a trauma like being beaten every day by, you know, yep. by, yep. by a parent yep. or by being, um, um, you know, the alcoholism that we have in our community is yep. rampant as well. Yep. It's not just uh, you know, methamphetamine and fentanyl. Yeah, alcoholism has always been a, con a constant within our community. And you can understand it. It's, it's a buffer. People use it to buffer the pain. The, and and the pain comes from um, you know the the breakdown of the of the mm -hmm. of the family unit, which largely happens because of uh, lack of economic opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not you're not doing well. You're frustrated, and next thing you know, you're kicking the dog. And yep, when the dog's not available to kick, you're kicking something else. Kick one of the kids. You're kicking yeah. one of the kids, or you're kicking you know the spouse. Yeah, and, exactly. And uh, and then we have a large number of. Um, single parent homes mm -hmm. and uh there's there's a big big gap in our community between the retirees who are relatively well off and the uh working class that are in um service jobs service sector jobs yep. that are barely keeping it together and now over the course of the last three or four or five years the uh rental um rates have gone through the roof yes it's just exploded. They've doubled and tripled. So I see homes now uh, for twenty five hundred a month mm -hmm. for a four bedroom, mm -hmm. two thousand a month for uh, for a three bedroom, like two to twenty five hundred for a three bedroom. I see uh, studio apartments for thirteen fifty. Oh, I know. It it's how what what how in the world are we going to be able to um to expect the people who are working in those service sector jobs, whether it's uh, working at the nursing home or working in a restaurant or work, uh, or you know, even somebody who's changing the tires at Les Schwab, yep. how do we expect them to be able to live in our community? So there's where, a- Where could they live nearby? Well- <laughs> uh, There isn't anywhere. Pistol River? I don't think so. Not no. really. <laughs> so generally people would live perhaps in a uh, mobile home park. Well, the problem is, is the majority of our mobile home parks are 55 and older parks. Yes. And if you take a park that is like a family type park, well, now the, now the space rents are going up. Yep. They're, they're yep. much higher than they used to be. But not only that, they don't have any vacancies. No. And so the next thing is a, you live in a trailer, a travel trailer or some sort of RV. And those spaces are all taken as well. Plus, they're going at like $600 a month now in a lot of places. So you end up trying to live in a car, and, well, then, that, and then they pass an ordinance, the city council passes an ordinance that says, you're not allowed to live in your car. Well, it makes it an insurmountable obstacle to employment when yes. you, know, you can't take care of your own basic needs, yeah. and then you're supposed to go to work. And there are people who do it, yeah, and we I encourage know. them, support them, and uh, try to figure out ways for them to be more effective in their, in their jobs. I'd like to talk a little more about the city's response. Uh, it apparently, I, I don't know exactly what happened, but apparently after St. Tim's did not participate in, in getting its kitchen approved with certain hours and twice a week, uh, while the other churches did, the city says, well, how are we going to get back at St. Tim's for disobeying us? Of course, they didn't have the legal right to do it, but that's a whole different question. And it became a two-pronged uh, attack. One thing is about food, but the other thing is much bigger, and it has to do with the entire ministry of every church in town. If a city planning committee 
and use an abatement procedure, which is usually used to deal with physical eyesores like uh, rusty trailers and old tires on some lot, or people who've done things without having a permit for them. They're using an abatement procedure that is totally inappropriate for a church, threatening $720 a day fine until somebody uh, apparently thinks it's acceptable what their ministries are. And then to justify this, they went to two dictionaries and looked at one definition each. Now, when I taught high school, I often said there are certain things you should have learned in middle school or junior high. And one of the first rules with a dictionary is look at all the definitions. Yes, not just the not first one. Not just the one. first one. Uh, <laughs> it depends on the dictionary as to what the first one is. Yeah. Sometimes it's the first use of the word in English history. Mm -hmm. uh, other times it's what some dictionary editor thinks is the most common use. Right. But there are some words that have very, very different Many. definitions. And yeah. my favorite is the word, to illustrate this, is the word cleave. It has two extremely opposite definitions. It can be clinging to like, like right. to a bride and becoming one flesh and all that, or it can be what a butcher does in a with a meat cleaver. Yes. And anyway, to look in a dictionary and say, oh, we found it. It says a church is a building, uh, usually for Christian worship. That settles it. <laughs> You know, Pastor Robert, I think in a, in a kind of like a um, practical sense, uh, so, you know, we're, we're, we're supposed to, the, the request was for, well, I don't know about request, but we were told that we could no longer do our day shelter and our advocacy program. And the day shelter, what that just, you know, what that looks like is people come in who are wet and cold, perhaps, and they uh, have a chance to dry out while they wait to use the shower and uh, charge their phone while they do it and get a cup of coffee. And the thing that sort of bothers me about that is that what if, what if one of my, what, what if an indisputable, like a parishioner that is by everybody's definition a parishioner, somebody who worships, worships every s Sunday morning, what, what if it were you? Mm -hmm. what, what if it was you, Pastor Robert, one of my parishioners that I value highly? What if you came in and you wanted to get a cup of coffee during, because this is all happening during the office hours, mm -hmm. during our regular office hours that we've had for decades. So what if you wanted to come in and have a cup of coffee? Uh, does that meet the criteria of the day shelter program? And what if at the same time you're, you have, uh, your water has been shut off because of some unforeseen reason and you need to use the shower? Or, and because your water's shut off, you need to get a laundry voucher. And what if, what, what if there was some catastrophe that your home was actually, God forbid, lit fire and you had to, who knows what? I mean, I don't know. But my point is, is that, um, can I provide it to you, Pastor Robert, but not to someone else? Can I, can I provide that home, that service, that hospitality to you? And I have to discern who I can provide it to and who I can't? The, the clearest it's ridiculous. thing in the Bible about a Christian's life in response to people in need is in Matthew 25. And that specifically, uh, it's sometimes called the parable of the last judgment, says that when one responds with compassion and love, to people who are naked, to their, those who are hungry, to those who are strangers, to those who are unhoused, you are expressing your worship of Jesus. And that's so clear. Yep. And it's not for the state or the federal government, and certainly not for a scofflaw city council in Brookings to say, oh, that doesn't apply to us or those of, those of us who are Christian. That somehow we can, because we have someone who looked up a dictionary and saw one definition of church, we can define what ministry should go on on a property. That is outrageous. You know, you know, I was talking about the day shelter. Now, the other part of it, you know, that we're supposed to stop is the advocacy thing. What, what our advocacy, for me, what the word advocacy means is that if I'm advocating for you, I am taking on whatever it is that you're up against as if it were my own. Mm -hmm. So when I advocate for you, I am shoulder to shoulder with you taking on that burden as if it were my own. 
so uh, when somebody comes in for alms, they uh, maybe they need their rent paid or maybe they need their um, utilities paid. That's been the more traditional kind of a thing that we do when we're doing our alms. We still continue to do that now. We've done that ever since our ever since the church uh, was founded. We've always had an alms fund, and um, so when the person comes in, it's we have to get to know the person first. I spend at least 20 minutes with a person before I write any check or mm -hmm. offer any kind of financial assistance. And that's the way it has always been. We, we try to establish a relationship to figure out what exactly is this person's need, because maybe it's something different or more, yep. or, maybe, uh, how, or maybe we need to think about how do we prevent this from happening in the future. Mm -hmm. And so I take on what their issue is, is if it were my own, right. even if it has to, because sometimes I actually do need to go, you know, usually I do it through writing a check and then have them take it down to say Coos Curry Electric, but sometimes I go my own self. Mm -hmm. And so we've always had this alms program that uh, was distributed by me and the demand became so great that I couldn't do it by myself. Remember, I'm bivocational part-time getting $1,820 and back then I wouldn't even get that much each month. And so I needed more people to help me with that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you know, we, um, we ended up recruiting some people. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the one gal unfortunately passed away. And another gal, um, she went on a world cruise. And then another gal. Anyway, by the t eventually we have the team that we have now. Mm -hmm. And so they're, the definition of what they do is they advocate for people and they assist me in the almsgiving because I can't do it all by myself. No, of course not. And also I, I hate to tell you this, guys. Um, I'm looking at that clock, and that clock is telling us that we're just about out of time. I, I have a short... Very quick. You have uh, two seconds. <laughs> part yeah. of the type of help they give often is basic stuff about how to get birth certificates, yeah. how to get IDs, yeah. uh, how to get uh, criminal charges expunged if they can be. Yep. And uh, those are really important to many people who are in that situation. I know. I know. Well, we are, as I say, we're just about out of time, so we have to start wrapping this up. But um, the lawsuit has now finished all of its depositions. I think you're now waiting for summary ju judgment, is that? Yeah, that's right. Okay. So th hopefully that will happen sometime in the next century, can <laughs> we hope? <laughs> I, I don't know what the time frame is. <laughs> I mean, seriously, you know. for a jury trial, too? No. Well, it's... well we will if the, if the motion for summary judgment is denied. Then right. we, we, originally, right. we did ask for a jury trial. Right. Okay. So we're just going to have to kind of wait and see how things work out. I think that certainly things are moving from from what I can see, things are moving in the right direction. Um, so we'll just keep, and I will have both of you back again, you know, as soon as we've got some new information. Um, I want to thank you both for, you know, making the time to keep us updated because this is important stuff. This is stuff we need to know. So, and thank you Thank you, thank you for your advocacy and your, you know, your love. So, you know, this really. This is an issue of extreme nationwide importance. Yes, I know. And the city just cannot have the attitude of, well, we don't like this law. We'll just scoff at it. Oh, I know. And the only answer to that is send the scoff laws out. There's a recall coming up. Absolutely. <laughs> I take no position on that, by the way. Kids. Yeah, I know, I mean, not just technically. So you know, I, yeah. I, I, no, yeah. I, I really don't. Oh, okay. All right. Well, you're allowed. I, I wear a, a I don't button. Li I don't live in the city limits. And <laughs> oh, I, and right. I, and I also am not a political person. Yeah. Okay. Um, I also want to thank our audience for tuning in. KCIW is your community radio station run entirely by volunteers and funded by donations and grants. Join us. Go to our website, kciw.org, to volunteer or donate. We'd love to have you as part of our family. I'm Candace Michelle, and this is our community.